Alrighty, folks, uh, let's kick things off. Um, how's it going? Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm part of the Dino team. And uh, today what we're going to do is kind of give you a <clears throat> uh, sort of in-depth overview of the uh, publishing process and the and the process for using modules that have been published to JSR, the JavaScript registry, which um, as some of you probably know, uh, we on Friday opened up JSR.io uh, for public beta. So anyone can sign up. Uh, so sign up today, uh, JSR.io and start uh, kicking the tires. And uh, basically uh, what uh, JSR is, is a uh, sort of new package registry for JavaScript and TypeScript modules. So uh, it's important to note that it is a, uh, a registry versus a package manager. So a package manager uh, is something like the NPM client or PNPM client or uh, Yarn, something like that, uh, that actually handles the installation of packages from a registry. And uh, JSR is actually not that. JSR is a registry that can be used with uh, multiple uh, kinds of package management systems, uh, such as uh, NPM. So you can actually use JSR to install packages via the NPM client, Yarn, PNPM, um, as we'll see here in a moment. And uh, Dino also actually acts as a package manager when you use Dino locally. So uh, JSR packages can be used in much the same way you would use HTTP imports um, in Dino, um, that sort of thing. So uh, we'll get into all that and uh, much more um, as we go. But um, the uh, point of today is uh, not only to give you a demo of how JSR works, but to uh, take a look at any questions that you have or any, any specific things that you'd like us to focus on. Um, as uh, I usually do during a stream, I'm going to be looking over in this direction um, over at chat. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to pop them in. And I'll do my best to kind of guide the demo in that direction or answer those questions as we go. Um, and also, I'll uh, definitely hang out for a chunk of time at the end to uh, just kind of go through the queue and see what questions we have and make sure we get as many answers um, as we can. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, dive in. So um, one thing to uh, note, if you haven't seen this already, is the uh, there is this little link down here. Um, underneath the description of JSR that says uh, why JSR, and it kind of takes you through some of the uh, primary reasons why uh, the Dino team originally started building JSR. Uh, but in broad strokes, um, JSR is a way to kind of uh, do for the uh, package management ecosystem what we're trying to do with Dino, which is to learn from the lessons of the last 15 years of server-side JavaScript and um, and kind of try to reimagine uh, what a package registry should uh, should behave like in 2024. Now, uh, with JSR, though, uh, that doesn't mean we're going to be reinventing or like trying to replace NPM or sort of fork NPM and go in a completely different direction. Uh, that's not the case at all. Like JSR actually is built uh, to interoperate with NPM, um, and we'll see how that works in a little bit. But it's uh, completely additive to the NPM ecosystem versus trying to uh, replace it. Uh, we think that eventually JSR is going to make a lot of sense for uh, package authors to kind of target primarily and then maybe also publish to NPM um, just because JSR is going to do some work for you in terms of documentation generation and a few other uh, niceties that we'll see here in a sec. But um, again, JSR uh, intended to coexist uh, with NPM um, into the future and can indeed just be used as an alternate registry backend for NPM. So um, if you're using a node uh, node project of some kind, basically any project that has a node modules folder uh, will be able to use JSR at the end of the day. Uh, another thing we want to do is design the experience to be sort of TypeScript first or TypeScript optimized. So uh, in 2024, like a lot of non-trivial code bases are being developed in TypeScript um, or in uh, you know, sort of TypeScript adjacent um, ways where like maybe you are writing vanilla JavaScript and ESM uh, modules, but maybe you're using JS doc comments um, to provide like the type guidance um, instead of writing actual TypeScript. Um, but in either case, uh, you know, taking advantage of that sort of standardization that's happening um, helps you make a better package management experience. Um, so we'll see you know, integrated API docs. And um, at publish time, there's going to be checks that kind of uh, look to make sure that your code is adhering to best practices. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do um, in the registry to um, improve the quality of the packages you write if you kind of design for TypeScript as a part of the experience. Uh, 
it's also uh, a, the, a registry that is intended to be ESM uh, only. So ECMAScript modules are the only types of modules that are allowed um, within JSR. And uh, we think it's time to do that. Uh, ESM is the web standard for modular JavaScript code these days. And uh, it's time that the registry embraced that as well. So lots of other uh, reasons why you might um, you know, why we built JSR, why you might consider using it. Um, but at the end of the day, we just think it's going to be a, a great experience for TypeScript authors, especially uh, authors that want to provide sort of cross runtime uh, TypeScript modules that can work basically anywhere the JavaScript works. But that's uh, more than enough chatting. Uh, let's get into a quick demo. And uh, once again, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll glance over from time to time to uh, see what's going on. Um, so let's kind of start completely from scratch. So I have a directory here um, with uh, nothing in it at the moment. And what we're going to do is create a module uh, or create a package with some modules in it, uh, publish that package to JSR, and then we'll demonstrate how to consume that package um, in both the context of a node and a Dino project and kind of look at some of the, some of the differences there. So uh, let's start off by creating a module that we will publish. So uh, let's make a directory um, and we'll call it um, sort of, um, you know, let's call it uppercase, say. Um, lots of different uh, things that we could make uh, our module do. But in this case, what I think I'm going to do is create a module that'll just take a string of text and convert it to all caps. So if you ever need to log out to the console angrily, uh, you'll have a convenient utility for doing so. Uh, so let's head into that uh, directory. And we'll start off by creating uh, a Dino.json um, because I'm actually going to be developing this module in Dino. But uh, you don't have to actually use Dino to develop your module. You can use uh, you know, Node or Bun or whatever, you, whatever TypeScript runtime is convenient. Um, if you're not developing a Dino project, uh, then you probably create like a, a JSR.json, uh, which can do all the same stuff that I'm about to show you in this demo. So if you are using a non-Dino uh, runtime, uh, you have that, that option as well. Um, but in this case, I am going to call it a dino.json. And I'm just going to create uh, mod.ts, um, which is going to be sort of the primary entry point for our application. And I'm also going to create a readme.md. Uh, so a readme file uh, will kind of be like the home page for our module. And it gives us a chance to have a kind of granular control over what the landing page experience is like when somebody finds our module on uh, JSR. So uh, let's fire up uh, Visual Studio Code and uh, start developing our module. So I'm just going to blow that up a little bit to make sure folks can see. Um, that should be OK. So here again in the readme, um, we'll start off just by saying, you know, the uppercase, uh, this module helps you get angry in the terminal. And then we'll say it is MIT licensed. Um, although we don't have a, a license file just yet, that's fine. Um, it should suffice uh, for now. So uh, this readme file is going to be sort of, again, the home page for our module. And then when we get into uh, mod.ts, we're just going to create a very simple um, ECMAScript module in TypeScript that takes a string of text and returns a string of text that has been converted to uppercase. So I'm going to uh, export um, a function called uh, uppercase. Um, and it's going to take a string, which is of type string, and it is going to return a string as well. And uh, I'm just going to take that input string and uh, convert it to, uh, you know, convert it to uppercase. So we'll, we'll return. Um, well, actually, let's let's make this a little bit more exciting. We'll add some uh, exclamation points uh, as well. So we're going to return um, the string that we were passed. And then uh, a couple exclamation points for good measure. And then we'll call uh, two uppercase on the whole thing. Um, and that should probably be uh, sufficient for our purposes. Now, uh, for our function, we already, like through TypeScript, we'll, you know, 
get some basic type information, but we might want to provide some additional documentation that can be used to generate you know, online reference for our module. Uh, so for that, uh, we're going to introduce some JS doc uh, comments. So um, in Visual Studio Code, what I just did, by the way, is I just did uh, you know, slash star star. And then when I hit tab, um, it creates a JS doc uh, comment so I can start filling in uh, some context information about parameters and uh, our return type. So for the string parameter, um, you know, the string to capitalize and then returns, you know, an uppercase string with three things, uh, we'll say appended. Great, and then I can also um, up here just provide some general context on the function. This uh, function converts a string to all caps with appended. And I can actually also use this space to uh, provide some um, examples of how to use it. So um, if I wanted, I could, you know, here say, um, you know, import, um, I think the way that we're doing this is we would actually, you know, import uppercase from, um, it'll be, end up being at the end of the day, kwinnery slash uppercase. That'll be the module name. And then, you know, console.log uppercase hello world. Um, so we can include a little bit of usage, and then this example is actually going to show up in our automatically generated uh, API reference as well. So that should be pretty good. We got we got some documentation coverage here. We included an example. We have a readme. Um, I think we're ready to actually ship this module to JSR now. So I'm going to go into Dino JSON, and within my Dino JSON, I can specify some basic uh, information about this uh, package. So the first thing I need to specify is a name, uh, which is going to be a combination of a scope name and a package name. So on JSR, all packages are scoped, so there aren't any top-level uh, packages like there are on um, NPM, say. Um, and you can create scopes. Uh, you, there's a certain number that you can set per account, but you can request an increase in that limit if that's uh, something that's a problem for you. But um, you know, my personal scope, uh, I just aligned to my GitHub username, and um, we'll, we're going to call this uh, uppercase, and that's going to be you know the name of my package. Um, I also need to include a version. So uh, I'll just call this 0.0.1 as the first ever version of the package. Uh, and what else do I need? I have a name, I have a version, and I need some exports. So uh, the exports uh, lets you specify um, you know, which modules should be sort of inc or sort of uh, includable from this uh, from this particular package. So in this case, I only have one module, but if I had multiple modules that I would want people to be able to work with when they imported uh, from JSR, um, I could specify multiple exports um, here as well. Um, but in this case, I really only need one, which is going to be you know dot slash uh, mod ts here, um, which is going to contain my one and only um, exported function, the um, you know the uppercase function. All right, great. So we have our package. It seems to be doing what we want. Um, you know what? The heck, for good measure, let's just do you know quick test um, for this, so we can make sure it's doing the thing that we expect it to be uh, doing. So um, let's uh, import um, assert uh, equals say. Uh, from, um, we actually have uh, the Dino standard library uh, as published to JSR now. Um, so I should be able to just say uh, JSR uh, colon um, std um, slash, uh, I think it's just assert, something along those lines. Um, I might have to actually just double check that. Let's go to the docs, and I think it's going to be std assert. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it. 
Okay. Yeah, great. Um, STD assert. And I can, um, in sort of Dino, fa uh, you know, Dino fashion, I can use a specifier and directly include that um, in my code. Um, if I don't want to do that, then I can, um, I could include this in an import map um, as well. So, oh, wait, I just said const. I want import, don't I? Silly old bear. Um, all right, so we have um, at this point an uncached uh, dependency. That's totally fine. I'm happy to uh, cache that. And then it's a, it also tells me that assert equals hasn't been used that, but I know that. So let's say uh, Dino test, and we'll describe this as test angry uppercase. And uh, within this test, um, we just need to use uh, our module. So import uppercase from that module we just created. Great. And then uh, let's create a string of text. And we'll uppercase uh, foo, in which case we would expect um, sir equals string. Uh, and then what we would want in response is foo in all caps with three uh, bangs attached. And if we run that test, um, it looks like we uh, successfully you know, got that test run going. So we should be, should be good to go. Um, and by the way, the, this is just like a nicety in Visual Studio Code. If you're writing tests, you can execute individual tests like right from the UI. Um, but of course, um, from my terminal, I could do a Dino test and it would run my test there as well. I might also want to throw a Dino uh, FMT on here so we could you know, make sure all, all of our uh, stuff is formatted nicely. So um, that was already looking good, but I think our Dino.json you know, needed a little bit of help as well. So with this, I think we are now uh, now completely ready uh, to publish to JSR. So uh, I'll stay in the terminal here for uh, convenience. But if uh, you know, I want to uh, do a publish, uh, there's a few ways I can do this. If I'm using Dino for development, uh, Dino publish is built right into the Dino CLI, the most recent versions. Um, if I were in a node project, I could also run npx uh, JSR publish. And under the, under the covers, that's actually doing the same thing. It's uh, the JSR uh, command on NPM is actually downloading a Dino binary and is kind of shelling out to that to do the actual work of publishing. So um, at the end of the day, doing the same thing. But uh, if you don't have Dino installed, uh, that MPX command can do a lot of the uh, a lot of the stuff that the Dino client can do. Um, but in this case, we're just going to say uh, Dino publish. And it's going to uh, take us out to the browser here, where I will be, you know, prompted to create a scope. Um, so I'm first going to create this, um, create the scope. I have to approve this um, as like a two-factor authentication step. And then actually, in a minute, I'm taken directly to the new uh, homepage for my module. So uh, this is already looking pretty good. I have, uh, you know, some documentation on the homepage, and then I have sort of usage instructions. Um, across these different uh, runtimes where uh, where JSR packages work. So uh, if I go to the uppercase function, um, now you can see um, I can you know have some guidance on how to import uh, this function specifically. And uh, here's my uh, JS doc um, you know string that I created before, along with my example code. So this this is the example usage that I um, you know, that I created in my uh, comment earlier. And because of the type information from TypeScript, I also know that this parameter is a string and it returns a string um, along with it. So without really doing very much work, I have a reasonably well-documented, um, you know, package on JSR. So um, up on the right-hand corner, um, I'll point out this uh, score, which is uh, a quality score that JSR sort of automatically assigns to packages. Um, this is also something that uh, doesn't exist on NPM, and it's a way for us to kind of help in search, like 
um, surface the best documented and uh, most performant uh, modules. So um, all of the packages that are going to that have uh, you know passed our sort of linting process for like checking for slow types, um, those will get higher scores. And yeah, if we go to the score, we can actually uh, take a look at some of those criteria. So it'll check if um, different uh, you know criteria have been met. So like, it doesn't have a module doc or have doesn't have examples in the README, and this one doesn't. So I get a red uh, uh, red X for that. Um, but it also looks for descriptions and um, you know looking for uh, runtime compatibility. So some of the stuff I can actually take care of in the browser right away. So I can go to settings and um, add a description. So create an angry version of a string with three bangs and say save. And you know my package score already increases a little bit um, just by adding a description. And then I can come down and say that I, as a module or a package developer, um, know that my thing is going to work in Cloudflare and Dino and Bun and uh, Node.js because I'm not doing anything too crazy. So it should work across all those runtimes. So I'm going to hit save again. And the quality score goes up quite a bit because I so because I have indicated that which platforms I support, and uh, you know because this you know package wor works across all those platforms, that gives it a slightly higher score as well. So now I just um, have a few things that I would need to improve, uh, which I will here in a minute. So this provenance bit uh, is basically certifies that um, the code that's been uploaded uh, comes from a trusted uh, source. Um, Mike asks um, from the, the chat, is there a way to see this info um, for a given package via the, the terminal? Um, and I actually don't think there is, but that's a great uh, bit of feedback. I, I'll, I'll capture that and share it with the crew. Um, I'm 99.9% .9 sure there's not a way today, but that makes a ton of sense and we should, uh, we should do that. So that's an excellent idea that I'll socialize with the rest of the team. Um, cool. So I will get to this provenance bit uh, here in a minute when we show how to publish from uh, CI, uh, and then we'll we could also add you know a module doc or an example in the README, which would get us to one hundred percent. But um, this is pretty good a pretty good start for now. Um, Okay, now that we've uh, you know published manually, um, that's that's great. You know we could um, just continue to publish manually from uh, from the command line, and that would probably be fine. But uh, what would be better is actually uh, publishing this from CI. So if we had our package in GitHub, which is very likely what we would do <clears throat> in reality, uh, we could set up uh, a GitHub action such that every time a version of this package was uh, you know, it's updated on the main branch, say like we would update uh, JSR um, automatically. So let's actually get that set up. So uh, for starters, we're going to go over to the settings here, and we're going to link a GitHub repository. So I'll choose like my personal GitHub, and then we'll call this, uh, you know, uppercase, ideally spelling that correctly, and let's save. All right, well, I, I, I actually have to create that repository first, don't I? So let's go to GitHub slash kwinnery. And let's create that repository now. So let's create a new repository. Uh, we'll call it kwinnery uppercase. And uh, give it a description. And it's going to be public. And we actually don't want to um, initialize it with a readme just yet, because we actually have code that we're going to push right up here right away. So let's go back out here to the terminal and we'll get init, get add everything in here, and then um, we'll do a commit with the initial content. And uh, yeah, I think we need to do branch, switch to the main branch, and then uh, we will add origin as a remote the usual song and dance from Git, <clears throat> and then we will push all of this good stuff up to um, Git right there. So sweet. Um, now we actually do have a GitHub repository with all of this information inside of it, um, and we can kind of go forward with configuring CI. So let me try saving this again. 
And it looks like we have successfully, um, you know, linked this GitHub repository, which is which is great. Now, if I go over to this uh, publish tab, it actually gives me some guidance on what I can do to publish. So uh, we saw publishing via the command line, um, but it also kind of gives me some guidance for how to set up a GitHub action that's going to uh, publish this for me from um, from GitHub. So. Let me create uh, this new uh, this new file um, in the repo here. Uh, maybe I'll do this in VS Code. So I'll create a new folder called um, .github and a new folder there called uh, workflows and a new folder there called or a new file there called publish.yaml. YML. And I can pop in there. Um, that uh, that code that I just basically uh, copied from the uh, you know installation guidance in the browser um, on JSR. Um, but basically, what's going to happen is on an Ubuntu machine, it's going to you know every time there's a push to the main branch, uh, it's going to um, use OIDC to authenticate against GitHub, so I don't have to like configure a personal token or anything like that. And uh, what it's going to do is check out my repository and use npx JSR publish uh, to kind of automate this step um, that I had to do manually before. So it's pretty uh, pretty simple action, um, but it only uh, executes successfully if I bump the package version. So um, I'm going to first like um, you know add that to my repository dash m. Um, Add publish action. Okay, so we push that up to the main branch, and now let's uh, rev my uh, package version. So I'll go into dino.json and set this to uh, 002. And if I commit that to the main branch, uh, my GitHub action should actually start uh, the publishing process right away. So so you could add that bump version. Great. And then, so I had updated the main branch uh, with just a new version number in my dino.json. And if I head over to GitHub Actions, oh no, what's, what's happened here? What's become of this? Um, I must have goofed up my uh, GitHub action configuration. Is GitHub workflows not what I was supposed to call this? Publish.yml. Oh, wait, did I not add the actual content? That's silly. I didn't actually save this file. Um, that's super embarrassing. So I'm going to add that. Actually, add content. Oops. And then let's push that up. And then theoretically, I feel like that should cause our action to run. And because we didn't actually get so far as publishing, um, I suspect it will, um, as a matter of fact, you know, do the publishing this time, um, which shouldn't take too long. So it's the longest part would be like downloading the uh, the binary to do the publication, um, but it looks like a lot of this stuff um, has completed successfully. And then in a few seconds, um, a new version of my module has actually been uh, published. Where's uppercase? There it is. And uh, because of that, um, I you know ha now have a very nice score uh, for my package, and I get this uh, provenance. Um, you know, guarantee that's shown on my package page, uh, which says that you know my uh, package has been updated from uh, GitHub Actions, which is sort of a uh, a blessed place for that uh, package build to happen. So, um, in just a few minutes, I you know created a module, set up uh, continue like public publishing from continuous integration, um, just by you know clicking a few uh, clicking a few buttons. So, um, as a module publisher. Uh, this is really, really handy. Um, the, this set of getting all of this set up would be a bit of a bother um, under a lot of other uh, circumstances. But now we have a pretty nice package that we can start using. So let's uh, take a look at kind of the um, the consumption side of this uh, next. So 
Uh, We'll start off um, on the Dino side, uh, which uh, is going to be, uh, you know, we will have a couple ways to interact with JSR there. So um, JSR is actually natively supported on uh, Dino. So there's a um, an option both to kind of use a JSR package from an import map or use a JSR specifier, um, as we actually already saw in uh, my, my test module. Uh, but let's make uh, a Dino a Dino consumer, and uh, in this uh, in this folder, let's create a. Um, let's just uh, I think we'll, all we'll need is like a mod.ts uh, to include it, and then uh, we'll also uh, create a Dino JSON, uh, which will will demonstrate uh, kind of how and why we need that. But um, so to consume the. Uh, you know the module from um, from Dino. Uh, we can use a JSR specifier, which uh, we saw earlier, or we can use this new command called uh, Dino add. And if you use Dino add instead of a JSR specifier, that's going to add an entry to an import map in your Dino.json that um, sets up an alias that you can use to import the module um, from your code. It also automatically checks JSR to look for the most recent version of a module and add a semantic version to your import map that, that makes sense. So in this case, I'm going to add uh, kwinnery uh, uppercase from JSR. Um, failed updating. Oh, you know what? Uh, because I think I touched dino.json, but I bet it was trying to like JSON parse it. So um, that's probably a bug we should uh, fix, honestly. But um, here in the Dino consumer, let's just fix that real quick. We can just at least add an empty object. And then if we run that again, um, we have this version. Um, added as a uh, as an import map um, alias. So we can see here that you know we have this kwinnery uppercase alias, which is mapped to this JSR specifier with a semantic version um, attached to it. And here, let me um, let's just open up a terminal. Um, so we can do this uh, from the context of VS Code. Um, one thing I want to do right away is uh, Dino format. Um, oh, it looks like it kept that on one line, but I don't really like that very much. So I'm going to have it format again, which should format the JSON eventually. There it goes. Oh, I needed to save it first. That's having a struggling with the saving of the files here today, clearly. All right, so we have our import map set up here. And then in our uh, mod.ts, um, we can once again uh, import um, uppercase from at kwinnery uppercase, uh, which the editor already knows about. And then I can console.log A little message there. And if I execute this uh, code um, with just uh, Dino run mod.ts, um, it download the thing that happened really fast there, which you might have even missed if you did, weren't watching the terminal, is because I uh, was running this for the first time, uh, Dino had to download and cache the version of the uh, dependency that I have uh, before it could run my code, um, which for the, uh, you know, for the uh, observer that uh, has used Dino before, uh, that behavior is actually very similar to what you would use with HTTP imports. And that's because JSR actually uses the same uh, techniques beh behind the scenes. Um, JSR is just like a nicer way of uh, specifying dependencies and allowing Dino to do uh, deduplication and things like that. But it actually still builds on the efficiency of HTTP imports by only downloading the files that you need. and um, you know, still, still kind of using those same mechanisms uh, behind or behind the scenes. So, uh, question coming in: uh, Is there a uh, there's a debate going on for default package manager? What is your opinion on that uh, with with Dino? So, I don't know that I have an opinion on a uh, a default uh, package manager. I I think that. Um, in a Dino project, uh, Dino add and using the import map is going to end up being, you know, convenient in a lot of cases. But um, 
actually like using a package JSON and using and using PNPM or Yarn or whatever um, are actually completely valid options. And there are reasons why you might want to do that. Um, I think it uh, it's pretty contextual. Um, I don't know that there needs to be a default, but um, it could be that um, you know Dino eventually for like Dino projects. Um, you know, will become the best way to do like uh, to sort of act as a package manager as well. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think like we have any official guidance certainly on like what package manager you should use. Um, but currently JSR works pretty well with lots of the um, options available. So uh, that's a quick look at um, you know how this works in the context of um, you know using an import map and the Dino add command. Um, but just for co uh, completeness, um, we could use uh, you know the JSR specifier here, and uh, when we deal with that, um, that's going to uh, reference a you know it's going to reference the cache and look for a version of this module because we ran this code once already. Um, it was already cached, so it was super fast. Um, but if we did um, mod uh, I think it's like uh, slash reload memory serves. Uh, it's one of those two, or it's like dash R or something. I forget what it is. What's Dino run uh, dash dash help. There is a way in which you can basically ask Dino to reload all of your cached uh, modules. And it's something like that. It's like uh, dash dash reload or something. Let's see. What is it? It's past all of these. You know, security bits. I think it's near the top. Yeah, dash dash r. I think I might have just used it in the wrong, maybe just out of order. So I think maybe if I went like run dash r uh, mod ts. Yeah, you could see like very briefly it actually re-downloaded uh, this JSR dependency. So. Um, either of these syntaxes work fine uh, without uh, specifying a version. Um, Dino is just going to try to look for the most recent version on JSR and use that. Um, but you could also specify a you know a particular version. So um, in my JSR specifier here, I'll just add that back in. And 002 is the most recent version. But like if I wanted to use a previous one, um, I, could, I could pin that within my JSR uh, specifier here. And um, if I did uh, this, it would actually have to download um, that other version as well, um, which did the same thing. Uh, our version bump before actually was just uh, for uh, purposes of kicking off a build. So they are equivalent in this case. So that's a quick uh, demo of how uh, you know using JSR uh, from a Dino project uh, works. But um, as we said, a node project can very happily um, use JSR packages um, just using a slightly different flow. So uh, let me go back out to my terminal. Um, so uh, Craig asks, um, if uh, JSR uh, does not have URL imports, how do you use a JSR module in the browser? And the answer to that today is through a bundler. So you can use uh, ESBuild or other uh, projects that are kind of designed to um, output a front-end uh, optimized build. Um, and those uh, types of bundlers are going to be compatible with JSR packages for the most part. Um, so today there isn't like a like an esm.sh like solution that's going to provide like a uh, like a CDN URL that can reference JSR. Uh, but um, esm.sh actually did announce recently uh, experimental support for JSR. So there actually might be some options out there for you for um, automatically including JSR packages in the browser um, through a, through a URL too. So uh, today the answer is um, you know you can target browsers through bundlers um, or experimentally through esm.sh. Um, but we are also kind of looking at other ways to make that um, make that potentially easier. Okay, awesome. So let's go uh, back up one. Um, and let's create a folder to show like node usage of JSR. So um, we'll create a folder called uh, node consumer. See, you know, consumer. And then in this project, we'll just use NPM, uh, but we could very easily use uh, PNPM or yarn uh, to do this same, um, these same operations. Um, but let's initialize 
our uh, folder here with uh, a package.json. And then uh, let's touch a, <clears throat> we're gonna uh, author a uh, ESM module. Um, so we want to create a file called um, you know, index.mjs indicating that this is a, um, an ESM module. There are other ways we could do that. Um, there's a configuration flag in uh, package.json where we could say that this project is, uh, uh, is ESM by default. Um, but in this case, it's uh, sufficient to just say, uh, just name that file um, and know it'll be able to work with that just fine. And <clears throat> let's open up uh, Visual Studio Code here. And again, our package.json doesn't do anything too exciting as yet. And uh, index.mjs uh, does literally nothing. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and start by installing our uh, package, our JSR package uh, to um, our node modules folder for this project. So most of the time when you're installing a package from NPM, uh, you can do like NPM add <clears throat> and then specify the name of the package. So if my package was on uh, NPM in the kwinnery scope, I would say NPM add um, at Kevin Winery or at kwinnery uppercase. Um, but because our package is not hosted on the NPM registry, instead of NPM add, uh, we have another command you use. So npx JSR add uh, kwinnery uppercase. And uh, what that's doing is um, this JSR module is, or JSR package is published on NPM. And NPX allows you to execute a package on uh, NPM as, as an executable uh, command. So we're actually <clears throat> NPM installing JSR and then immediately using JSR to execute this command. So JSR add uh, kwinnery uppercase. Um, so we'll do that first. And uh, it prompts me to install uh, JSR, which I am uh, quite happy for it to do. And <clears throat> that does a couple of things for me. So uh, in the package.json, uh, I have a alias set up for uh, kwinnery uppercase. Uh, but uh, this configuration is actually slightly different than what you might be used to if you're importing modules from um, NPM. So um, we are actually using a custom uh, scope for JSR to indicate that we are uh, importing a module from JSR. And then uh, this um, syntax here, or this sort of notation here, indicates that on the JSR scope k winery, uh, we are you know including the uppercase uh, module. So for the most part, you don't actually really have to worry about this, except for the uh, semantic version or whatever version you want to pin to. Um, but that is uh, something to point out. And the other thing that gets generated is this npm rc file. So um, we actually use the extension mechanisms that are native to npm uh, to extend it to use uh, JSR as like an npm compatible registry. So basically, what we're telling npm is that uh, for all the packages in the JSR scope, um, use this registry instead. So this is like a mechanism that's often used to like if you have like a custom uh, you know package registry, you could configure it here. In this case, we're taking advantage of this extension point to create a custom um, you know scope for JSR, which we can then reference uh, through the package.json here. And if we explode the node modules folder, um, you can see that you know this uh, you know the uh, uppercase module has already been installed for me. And a couple of really nice things have happened here without me having to do any work. So my uh, my function is automatically transpiled to uh, JavaScript using a uh, TypeScript compiler, and I uh, I've also it's uh, JSR has also generated this dot uh, t uh, dot d.ts file, um, which is necessary for uh, editor support in my uh, in my project. Um, and then depending on where you're consuming it, um, this this file may or may not sort of be picked up. Um, by default, which we'll see here in a moment. So um, in index.mjs, now I have the ability to just um, import this uh, import this module. So I'm going to say, you know, import uppercase from kwinnery uppercase. And um, again, without um, doing any work here, um, I you know, this module is being recognized. It's showing up in my um, in my editor. And I can console.log, um, you know, uppercase 
Hello, Node. And uh, I can happily, you know, execute that uh, file. And now my uh, my package does the same thing um, as it would in any other uh, any other context. So the uh, if you also were to use a uh, a TypeScript project. Um, you would be able to, uh, you know, do that. So if you are using bun to execute uh, this code instead of, um, you know, instead of Node, um, that's that's uh, an option that would be available to you. So um, if I were to like maybe rename this to uh, .ts, let's let's do that instead of uh, MJS, I call it uh, index.ts, and um, you know the TypeScript in um, TypeScript integration for VS Code. Um, isn't currently set up to uh, resolve this module name. Um, most of the time, if you're using like a TypeScript project, um, you know you, you'll have like a TS config already set up that does this um, resolution for you. But in this case, um, I can just create a uh, TS config uh, .json, and I can add some compiler options um, that are going to uh, give VS Code enough uh, hint as to uh, you know where it can find information about um, this module. So I'm going to set like module resolution to node next, and then I think I also have to add um, yeah the module option. So I think that is set to node next as well. And now uh, with uh, this TS config setup, um, this should actually. Um, you know, start to pick up the you know the uppercase um, .d .ts. So now I have like you know all of my editor support um, all set here, and um, I can execute this uh, TypeScript file. So if I'm going to say you know bun um, index .ts, um, now I can actually natively run that uh, that TypeScript code in. Um, in Bun as well, and it can you know interpret that and uh, use the same uh, Node modules folder. So uh, again, though that's kind of the uh, whistle stop tour of how you're going to be able to use uh, a JSON or excuse me a JSR package in a Node project. Um, if you're you know using TypeScript, um, you whatever your TypeScript environment is is still going to be able to benefit from uh, the typings that you configure um, for your project. But JSR is actually going to do all the work of um, creating these .d.ts files, uh, creating your um, exports, and uh, doing all of the kind of drudgery of setting up this module to be consumed in Node. And really, the only cost to you is instead of um, installing with uh, npm install, you just run npx JSR add, and then that does the configuration for you. Um, but you can also uh, subsequently uh, run npm install. And um, if you update version numbers or do anything like that in package.json, that'll automatically fetch the latest versions from JSR as well. So that npx command is really only necessary to set up that alias that we saw earlier. Um, at this point, um, you know you can treat this uh, project um, just like you would any other npm uh, project. So. Um, I think that's uh, where we're going to call it in terms of the demo. But at this point, uh, if folks have questions, um, I'd love to answer any of those. So I'm going to head over to the chat and um, pull up one of the questions. So how does DNT fit into the uh, JSR uh, landscape? So um, DNT, for those, uh, those of you who don't know, is a utility uh, made by uh, David on the Dino team that takes a Dino package and um, generates a node compatible package. So um, you could write TypeScript code in Dino um, and then run it through DNT and it would generate like sort of an N NPM compatible folder that contained like common JS exports and uh, exports for uh, ESM and kind of did a lot of the gymnastics that were required to publish a TypeScript module to uh, to NPM. And uh, right now, like some of not like uh, the techniques of DNT aren't being used uh, sort of one for one in JSR. Uh, we have some of the same types of um, constructs, but um, 
I would expect to see like a couple of things. Number one, like JSR will probably continue to implement uh, sort of DNT like features where we'll make it easier to publish directly to NPM uh, just through the JSR publishing workflow. Um, so that's something that you can inspect to see. But uh, for the immediate term, like if your use case remains like, I would like to author my code uh, using Dino, but then generate a node compatible um, folder that I can then publish to NPM. Um, that's probably still going to be the best way to do that in the immediate term. Um, but again, we'll be uh, kind of looking at, um, you know, integrating everything that you can do with DNT into the JSR flow. So um, that's kind of maybe how to think about that relationship, at least for right now. Uh, excellent question. Any other questions uh, from the from the folks on the line? I'll embrace uh, a bit of awkward silence uh, before um, endlessly bantering. But um, if you do have any more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, also, if nothing is popping out to you right now, um, we will uh, we have the JSR channel on uh, Discord on the Dino Discord. So if you go to discord.gg slash Dino, um, you can look for the JSR channel and join us there to provide you know any feedback and talk to the community. We also have a JSR feedback uh, channel um, where you can drop any just sort of ideas, hopes, dreams you have for JSR. And then finally, uh, JSR is itself uh, free and open source. So if you go down to the very bottom of the page, there's this uh, GitHub link. And uh, this is the source code for the JSR uh, registry in its entirety, like our cloud configuration, kind of everything in between. So um, if you would like to contribute to JSR, um, feel free to head out and, uh, and do that. Um, or if you find an issue with JSR, either like the JSR command or the website, um, basically anything, um, go ahead and add it as a GitHub issue. And we're uh, pretty aggressively attacking these issues as we find them, especially kind of in the early going here. So um, make sure to provide us some feedback there. All right, so it looks like we have um, a couple more questions. Is there a way for uh, local development is one of the uh, questions. So um, if you're doing local development of a package, um, you can use the testing workflow I saw, but I'm I'm guessing that maybe the actual thrust of the question is, is there a way to do like an NPM link style, like I'm developing a module and then I want to test it as a consumer of the module, like in another uh, directory, uh, which is a thing you can do with NPM. And there would be ways to go about it. You could certainly do, if you were like testing from, um, you know, testing from Node, you could actually do the same thing. Like you could NPM link to uh, a, another version of the package, but you would have to have a package.json within your um, folder that contained your source code. So if that specific flow um, was required, it would be possible to use NPM link for local development. Um, I think it would probably require a little bit of uh, extra work. Like if you were developing in Dino normally, but you wanted to NPM link you know, your local version of the package. Um, that is uh, that is probably something you could do. Um, and Dino uh, has a similar flow for, um, you know, doing a local link. You can actually create an alias that can target a, uh, you know, a local folder. Um, so there are, there are ways to go about doing it. Um, it would kind of be dependent on the, on the context. Um, so we have another question. Uh, why not have the capability claims um, backed by tests like CI, like GitHub Actions for browsers, make it individual by browser using headless versions of CI. And test servers are runtimes too. Yeah, so uh, the compatibility claims, um, that is something that uh, we did uh, kind of consider different ways to approach it. Um, in the sort of immediate term, we kind of, we made it a like configuration option for developers. Basically, as a way for them to like define what the surface area of their uh, package is. So, like, I as a package author could decide like I support uh, Node and Bun and uh, you know Cloudflare workers or what have you. Um, 
but I don't test on browsers, so I can't like certify that my package actually works on browsers. So I'm not going to set that as a compatibility flag, um, even though like maybe I could, or maybe my module does work um, under certain circumstances. Um, leaving it up to the developer allows you to, it, it's essentially a way to declare which runtimes you support versus like which runtimes your code theoretically works on, uh, which is a, a, you know, a very, you know, subtle uh, distinction, but um, a distinction that uh, we're going with right now. But um, that's also something we could change. Like uh, I could see us, um, you know, running test suites for uh, packages in different environments and doing some kind of automatic detection um, in the future. Um, we haven't really scoped out any work around that yet, but um, it's certainly something that you know, could appear in the in the future, but for now, it's like something that d the developer gets to decide, kind of what they what they want to support. All right, so we have a question. Uh, you know, any anticipated timeline for the final release of uh, JSR? So, um, JSR on Friday was released in uh, what we're calling a public beta. So. We're pretty pleased about the stability of the software generally, but we think we have a lot to learn still from the community about the behavior of the software. Um, we think we have a lot we need to improve about the publishing flow, um, ways to support kind of bringing existing TypeScript code bases into JSR. Um, so we just think there's a there's more dogfooding and like developer experience work we need to do before we'd be comfortable sort of applying a, a GA uh, label to JSR. Um, and so for, for that reason, because we are, are in a kind of, we don't know what we don't know phase, um, we don't have like a final um, date in mind for when we would sort of declare JSR to be uh, sort of GA and uh, ready for prime time. Um, but um, that being said, we're uh, the nature of the issues that we're finding are more around, um, you know, user experience and uh, compatibility versus, you know, reliability of the system. So um, I would actually expect to, at some point this year, be able to declare that JSR is, is basically uh, generally available and could be, um, you know, can certainly be used for in production today. Um, but I think there's a lot more we would need to do to ensure that like the interface interfaces wouldn't drastically change at some point in the future. Um, any last questions? We've got about four minutes left before I let you go. So feel free to drop any in um, if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, as I mentioned earlier, uh, discord.gg slash Dino is the place to go. You can join us in the uh, JSR channel or leave feedback in the JSR feedback channel on Discord. Um, we're out there uh, checking out Discord pretty frequently. So um, you're likely to find uh, one of us um, who will engage and answer your questions. Um, but uh, seeing no uh, immediate questions, I'm probably going to gavel it here. Um, once again, thank you very much to everybody uh, who hung out live and asked questions. Um, I hope you do get a chance to check out JSR pretty soon. Um, we've been uh, working really hard on it. We think it's uh, a great step forward for um, Dino users and JavaScript users generally. And we're pretty excited about like uh, providing this as a public good to the entire JavaScript ecosystem. So um, in the fullness of time, we hope this is kind of the best way to do package management uh, or sort of uh, you know a registry that works really well for kind of the entire ecosystem, um, you know, package manager aside. Um, and we think uh, that'll be true in the not too distant future. So I uh, hope you're enjoying using JSR. Definitely check it out. Um, and if you find any bugs, make sure you let us know so we can uh, jump on those and fix them. Um, but otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And if you're watching the recording, um, thanks for checking that out too. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, bye.